Excellent. All right, I will turn the floor over to Mark Price. Great. Thank you, John, and thank you, everyone, for um, taking time out of your day to, to join us. Uh, you may hear um, strange weather-related sounds. It's raining cats and dogs in Harrisburg, and my office is kind of close to the street, so you, you might hear a, uh, something that sounds a little bit like um, Sleepy Hollow uh, going on outside, um, and I apologize for that. So we are discussing what is really a very difficult and and um, complex topic. And as reflecting that, you're looking at the outline of my presentation today. It looks a little intimidating, um, a lot of bullet points there, uh, but it will hopefully go fairly quickly and easily. And, and of course, you have the paper, which you can go through. And, and at the end of the presentation, I'll give you my contact information. If, if you have questions that this work inspires, I'm happy to, to sort of go over those with you. Um, we're going to start, of course, by giving you a sense of, of how property taxes compare uh, to other states in Pennsylvania, how they've changed over time, in particular looking at um, individual school districts. Um, we're going to also look at how the distribution of revenues that are available for schools, whether they're coming from local governments through things like the property tax, um, but also state and federal money, how those revenue trends have changed over time, because we think those are an important dimension of understanding the, the trends that we observe in, in property taxes. But we're going to give you a sense of, of how those regional patterns in, in property tax burdens um, will, be, will impact and shape who benefits the most from proposals to eliminate school property taxes. Uh, we'll then shift to the actual nuts and bolts of how do you eliminate school property taxes. And essentially, you have to raise sales and income taxes to generate the revenue necessary to replace what local school districts are now generating through the property tax. And we've taken it, we've, we've looked at the distributional impacts, asking the question, how do low income, how do middle income families and, and high income families, how are they impacted by this overall proposal to eliminate school property taxes? We will then put forward our own sort of brief proposal to raise some additional revenue, which we think has an advantage over property tax elimination and that uh, first and foremost, it um, actually raises new revenues for schools, boosting overall the state's contribution, which we think is an important um, goal. Uh, but it also um, imposes a, a much smaller impact on low and middle income families relative to the proposal to raise to eliminate uh, school property taxes. And then finally, um, uh, we'll talk about uh, what's called a circuit breaker, which is a way in which to make the property tax a, a better tax, a fairer tax in a sense, because it does tend to be a tax that um, is regressive and, and we have a proposal that would um, reduce the regressivity of the tax and we think ultimately um, uh, lead to good outcomes. And then of course, sort of the final wrap up is, is essentially that um, we think that the the two most important issues in education finance in Pennsylvania, um, uh, which are sort of inequity, um, the inequality between individual school districts, uh, as well as school property tax burdens and, and individual concerns about them, we think the common thread that links them together is, is a failure over the last 16 years for the state as a whole to make increasing contributions to fund local education. And effectively, we have made it so that the burden of financing education still largely falls on local taxpayers. And that ultimately feeds inequality in terms of spending between school districts and also is, we think, one of the things that's generating the desire often to begin to try to reduce property taxes at the state level rather than going through school boards. So let's step into um, hey, hey, how... Hey, Mark, real quick, yes, this is John. Sorry to interrupt. I just wanted you to know that the, the slides on the screen right now are in presenter mode. So if you had notes or something that would show up on the screen. So if you want it, if you're able to do full screen mode, just to, to blow it up so people see a bigger picture. Oh, um, so if you see. So if you hit escape, I think if you hit escape and then you. Escape. Go, and then you um, maybe go up to slideshow at the top. If you can see that in the top of your screen and do yeah. start presentation from current slide. So right there from current slide over to this one. Yep. This one. All right. Here we go. Um, you probably still see it in presenter mode. It's still I don't have notes, so I think it's okay. No problem. All right. Uh, Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Here, here. Let, let me, uh, I think this may solve the problem. <laughs> 
everyone's your screen went black briefly, but um, all right, John, how's that? Perfect. Thanks, Mark. Sorry um, about that. I, I do. No, no, that's good. Thank you. I do need to get this box out of the way, though. Ah, there no, we go. It looks good. Yeah, okay. looks good. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Uh, new, fabulous, awesome technology, but the labor economist is stuck in the last century. So, how do overall property taxes in Pennsylvania compare to other states in our region? What we did is we examined data from the American Community Survey. It's a survey of households where uh, the Census Bureau is, is asking a household, what are your property taxes? Uh, this is relatively new data set. Um, we have about seven years. Uh, the data set's in five-year pools, so it makes it hard to gather trends over time, but it does let us sort of get a good snapshot of how property taxes overall, uh, and that's property taxes that include both the portion that, that go to schools, but also the portion that goes to local municipal government and county government, right? So it's the really the full, what you're looking at here um, is a picture of how property taxes impact um, uh, families in Pennsylvania overall without sort of separating out schools. Later, we'll come back and, and look at how schools impact in particular. You're looking at two measures on this graph. The first is the effective property tax rate. So basically what we're asking is um, what share of the value of a home do your property taxes represent um, in, in, its, in its simplest essence. So it's one way of sort of evaluating how high property taxes are. And that's the orange and the red bars, orange or red, depending on, on your eyes. And then the blue or gray bars, that's the property taxes as a, as a percentage of income. And, and so this is the, the measurement that we will use throughout here um, of property tax burdens, sort of asking the question, you know, of the income people earn, what's the property taxes they're paying? What do they represent of their incomes? And in Pennsylvania, um, uh, property taxes on average uh, represent uh, 3% of people's incomes. Um, that is less than, say, in New York or New Jersey, but it's greater than what you see in smaller states like Delaware and West Virginia. So this, the broader takeaway from this very complex chart is essentially that um, uh, we're about average. And if you use a different source, the Independent Fiscal Office uh, also took a look at property taxes across the entire United States, examining them relative to personal income, and they came roughly to the same conclusion, that, that property taxes as a share of people's incomes are about average in the state. So it's not an overall problem of high property taxes, certainly, uh, in the Commonwealth. Now, the ACS data is useful for a snapshot now, but it, again, it, it's somewhat limited if you want to see how things have changed over time. So. Something we did is um, the Department of Community and Economic Development collects on a voluntary basis uh, property tax millage rates for school districts, for municipalities and county governments. And we're able to take that data and, and examine how millage rates have changed over time. So that's the, the next chart um, that you're looking at. Uh, the blue lines are the percent change in millage rates um, from one year to the next. Uh, the red or orange line is the percent change in property taxes collected. Um, and again, this is across all 500 school districts. Um, we present property taxes collected in part to make sure that our uh, percent change in the millage rates looks right, because there are some challenges in analyzing millage rates over time, which we discuss in the paper, in particular when a school district, um, or excuse me, when a county reassesses property values, it makes it hard to compare percent changes. And we make some adjustments to deal with that in the, that we describe in the paper. Um, but the overall story is that we're satisfied that we've got a time series here that gives us a good sense how property taxes have changed overall in Pennsylvania over the last 16 years. And so um, what you see is that really in the period um, that corresponds roughly with the housing bubble in the United States, and we had a little bit of a bubble here in Pennsylvania from 2000 to, um, to 2008, the, the Great Recession, um, property taxes increased on average each year by about 3.4%. Um, in the period roughly corresponding between the beginning of the Great Recession and 2010-11, the average annual increase fell to around 2.4%. And then in the period since 2010-11, um, the uh, increases in property tax rates have fallen again. They're now averaging about 1.7%, although you do see that millage rates 
um, 15, 16, 16, 17 are beginning to drift up, although again, um, only slightly, and we'll, we'll come back and talk about that. Um, but this gives you a sense for how property taxes have changed um, in the Commonwealth over time. And, and certainly one of the takeaways and somewhat surprising, right, because property taxes do generate a lot of media attention in the last seven or eight years, um, is that the rate of increase in, in property tax millage rates overall across the Commonwealth is actually lower today than it was in, in the recent past. So uh, I think that's an important thing to, to acknowledge. One of the things I should talk about briefly, because we are plotting this, this orange line for property taxes collected, you see the big dive um, in, that, in those collections. That's simply a reflection of the impact of the Great Recession. And in particular, it was a collapse in housing markets. And that seems to have shown up for school districts in that they were collecting less um, property tax revenue, as you would expect um, as a result of foreclosures and whatnot that were going on, a very unusual event, and you see that here in the data. Uh, of course, millage rates are still um, somewhat declining over the street, but again, they're overall increasing, but the rate of, of uh, increase is getting smaller. That's one of the things to keep in mind. So, you were just looking at the average um, change across all 500 school districts. And now what you're looking at is a heat map, first of all, um, that examines the average annual change over the whole period. Um, so from 1999 to 2016-17, uh, for each school district, um, what is the average annual change in property tax rates overall in the Commonwealth? Over the last 16 years, property taxes are increasing by 2.6% a year. And then what you see here um, is a heat map where the, the reddish colors, um, uh, orange, yellow, red, as you go darker towards red, though the increases in property taxes are getting larger. As you go to the cooler colors, the blues and the light blue, um, the, the increases are getting smaller. Um, and one of the things you sort of and take away from this um, chart is that um, it's the eastern half of the state that has experienced the largest increases in property tax rates um, on average over this period. So certainly where property taxes are rising, this gives you a good picture. Um, for those of you familiar with population trends in Pennsylvania, um, this should also sort of draw your mind to, to those um, graphics that other organizations have shared, right? The western part of the state has been losing population over time relative to the eastern, uh, and certainly it's showing up here in, in property tax millage rates um, across school districts where you're seeing, not universally, but certainly you're seeing on average on the eastern half of the state, um, property tax rates are, are increasing a bit more on an average annual basis. So, To put those trends in, we think, the proper context, one of the other things we'd like to do is examine how the total pot of revenues available to educate children in each school district have changed over time in the Commonwealth. And so the next graphic, which I'm going to show you, um, plots out for all 500 school districts. Um, the, uh, the increase in, in locally raised revenue per student um, relative to state and federal revenues per student. So the, the local is the, the gray or blue bar and, and the federal and state figures is, are the red bar. So overall during this, the last 16 years, um, local school districts um, have raised They've increased their, the amount of revenue um, that they are raising per student by 37%. Um, the state and federal contribution, and that's including everything, so we are capturing every dollar that's going to these school districts, has increased over that same time period by, by just 30%. So one of the underlying trends um, that we think is driving property tax changes and also driving inequality between individual school districts is, is the persistent failure of the state um, to provide an increase in the state share of, of local education spending. Uh, and and you, that shows up quite clearly here uh, in that, you know, local school boards are, are taking more action, and it's not comfortable action, right? They're, they're moving to raise property taxes. They are elected in the same way members of the General Assembly are, um, but they are seeking to, to fund their schools because education is very important in almost every community in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and it's the locals that have done more 
to, to contribute to um, uh, educating children than, than the state over time. And we think that's a, a key pattern to keep in mind as, as you try to understand how property taxes have changed. This is a, a snapshot of, of the state contribution. Uh, in the paper, we discuss the whole pot of money here. I'm just looking at the basic education subsidy. And I want to focus in particular uh, on that last observation there. That's the proposed increase in the basic education funding line item. That's $100 million um, that the governor has proposed for this year. It's half of what the governor proposed last year. Um, and the House recently passed its own budget proposal, and although there are significant differences between the House and, and the governor in terms of the state budget, they both agree that basically they're going to try to deliver another $100 million to basic education funding. And, and that, I think, reflects something that we discuss in the paper, is that there is, in our view, certainly a consensus. Um, there is an interest in, in members of the General Assembly across both political parties to provide more state revenues to schools. But the problem is that they're constrained in how they can do that by um, the inability to, to establish or, or put together a coalition to raise more state revenues to fund schools. Um, and that is combining with other trends that we have talked about in our organization, the Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Center talks about uh, quite a bit. And that is that we are facing a, a large and growing um, structural budget deficits over time. So that this year, contributing $100 million to basic education funding, uh, that's being done in an environment where the budget that we signed last fiscal year is actually in deficit because we didn't raise as much revenue as we thought. And we're beginning the 17-18 budget year with a, a projected deficit, depending on who's doing the estimate, uh, in the neighborhood of, of $2 billion. So increasing the contribution to basic education funding uh, essentially means you've got to cut somewhere else in the budget if you're not going to raise additional revenues. And there's agreement, at least, among the Republicans and the Democrats um, to, to boost the contribution to schools to $100 million. But what we really lack um, in, and what's necessary uh, is, is agreement to raise additional revenues so that those revenues can go to fund local education. So now we're going to turn to the question of property tax burdens. And again, what we're going to be doing is using ACS data to compare the property taxes that um, individual homeowners are paying to their local school districts um, relative to their mean family incomes. And, and so again, this is a, a way of assessing the burden that a, a property tax imposes on families. And, and what's going to come up next is another heat map. So again, as you move to red values, those mean high. And as you go to um, uh, blue values, the, the, that's low property tax burden. So let me pull up the chart. Again, school property taxes. So we're now throwing out uh, property taxes um, paid to county and municipal government. We're just looking at our best estimate of what the contribution that homeowners are making uh, for their local schools across the Commonwealth. and um, Basically, the, the picture that emerges, with the exception in the West, uh, um, in Erie County and Allegheny County, a, a couple of school districts, the red values, by and large, are in the eastern half of the state, um, beginning up in the Poconos and then heading down into the southeast. Um, so that's where property tax burdens, at least you know, what you're paying in property taxes relative to your family incomes, are the highest. And then, of course, it's in the western half of the, the state. Um, where by and large property tax burdens are somewhat lower. Um, and that makes a fair amount of sense. It matches the, the pattern that we are seeing in the millage rate data over time, that most of the growth has been in the east. Um, it is more finely focused uh, than, than the millage rate data because it paints a very clear picture where property tax burdens are highest in the Commonwealth, and they tend to be a, a narrower group in, in the corner of the state. Now, while you sort of soak up the information in that graph, um, uh, I will note that we have made available online um, a online technical appendix, um, a very wonky thing to do. Uh, it has several tables. It's got a, a readme file that sort of tells you what's in each of the tables. And in those tables, you will find the local school district data. Um, for those of you that are interested in looking, you know, you want to look at a particular county, Erie or Allegheny County, and you can look at the figures that underline this graph so you can get a sense for um, 
uh, how it impacts your individual districts, because I know all of you haven't quite memorized um, where what your school district looks like uh, on this map. So, property taxes have generated uh, interest, especially in Harrisburg, um, for proposals either to reduce or eliminate property taxes. And, um, and what we wanted to do here in this paper is really sort of understand where property tax burdens, where they fell um, uh, across the Commonwealth, given that on average, they're not high relative to the rest of the country. So, you know, focus in on where they are actually high. And then um, we wanted to sort of ask the question, well, you know, what does this imply about who benefits most from the most extreme proposal that's been put forward so far, which is basically an effort to eliminate school property taxes. So to start that discussion, I have yet another heat map. Um, again, red values are high, blue values are low. Uh, these are dollar values now, and they're just school property taxes collected per student. Um, you'll notice that the picture looks a lot like uh, the property tax burdens where we were dividing uh, the property taxes that people pay into their incomes to get a sense for how much, how, how much that crowds out other spending in the household. Here, all we're doing is simply asking, all right, how much property taxes do you raise relative to the number of students you have? And the picture, there are some subtle differences that reflect there are some counties, particular down here um, uh, in the southwest corner, um, that rely on, on other than households, um, especially to, to raise property taxes, mining in particular. Um, but by and large, the pattern that you see here looks a lot like the property tax burden data that I showed you earlier, which was based on data from the ACS. And this, I think, ultimately shapes uh, very much who benefits most from property tax elimination. Um, and, and you'll see that in, in the next slide. Um, what we've done here is we've asked the question, um, if you eliminate local property taxes, and, and the way you do that under property tax elimination schemes is you raise the sales and the income tax sufficiently that you can replace all of the local revenue raised. So what that means is that the, the Reading School District, um, which collects um, $1,000 per student, um, it's gonna get $1,000 per student from the state when a property tax elimination proposal goes through, whereas Lower Marion Township down in Montgomery County, again in that northeast corner, um, uh, the, the red corner on this map, it, it collects um, property taxes per student in, in the order of $23,000 per student. So if you're eliminating those property taxes, that's the amount of money you're giving to Lower Marion, a very uh, low poverty um, school district, and, and Redding, a very high poverty, high need school district, uh, is gonna get $1,000. And this graphic here looks at all the school districts, so not just Redding and Lower Marion, it sorts those districts from uh, the high poverty, 125, that's this, this group here, the first quartile, um, and it, it figures on average, um, high poverty districts under property tax elimination will get $3,721 per student. Um, uh, low poverty districts, where Lower Marion uh, School District is, that 125, the lowest poverty, most affluent school districts, they would receive under property tax elimination $10,000, $10,700 per student uh, on average. And, and you see sort of the, the variation here runs in a way that, that's somewhat uh, unsettling in the sense that you are giving state money, um, uh, most of the state money to the highest income, most affluent districts relative to, to the low income districts. And really the best way to see that is to turn the question around and say, what if we took the same pot of money that was available under property tax elimination and ran it through the state funding formula? This is the formula that currently governs distribution of aid to, to, to local school districts. And the funding formula is designed in its essence to help address a, a fundamental inequity that exists overall in, in Pennsylvania. And that is that school districts like Reading um, uh, spend well less than half. Uh, of school districts like Lower Marion um, per student. And that's despite having a very high tax burden in, in the city of Reading. They have, relative to their wealth, uh, they're levying a, a very high amount of taxes. Uh, 
but it's generating a very relatively low amount of um, funds per student to, to educate their children. And that is a serious problem. Um, and we address that problem by running new state funds through a funding formula that takes into account both local property tax effort, but also needs within the local school district. If you take that pot of money that you would distribute through property tax elimination and run it through the funding formula and then compare it to poverty, this is how the distribution would shape out. The highest poverty school districts would get $12,647 per student um, if you ran the same amount of money that we would run through property tax elimination through the funding formula. The low poverty affluent districts, they would receive on average $3,107. So I think this sort of makes really one of the more important points in the paper, and, and that is that essentially um, uh, this is, is a poorly designed method of distributing state funds, property tax elimination overall, um, and really runs contrary to sort of the agreement that we have established of how we're going to distribute state funds over, over time in Pennsylvania. So, so far, we've only talked about property tax burdens. Um, we talked about differences that those burdens will imply about who benefits most from property tax elimination. Now we're going to switch gears and talk a little bit about tax incidents. So what are the, the tax burdens on taxpayers overall um, from the proposal to eliminate property taxes? It's very easy to discuss property tax elimination in, in its simplest form. People don't like taxes in general. Uh, and certainly um, the property tax is one where a lot of folks get a bill at the end of the year, unlike say the sales tax, and it generates a lot of interest and, and, and certainly some agitation to, to eliminate. But if you're going to eliminate property taxes, you have to do it by, by raising revenue somewhere else. And during the last legislative session, um, it was proposed that in order to fund property tax elimination, it would be necessary to raise the income tax rate from 3.07 to 4.95%. It would be necessary to raise the sales tax rate from 6 to 7%. And it would be necessary to expand the coverage of the sales tax um, from goods to uh, other goods, in particular food and services. Um, overall, um, our estimate produced for us by the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy is that we would be able to fund $14 billion in property tax relief for both residents and non-residents of Pennsylvania. And that's an important element to keep in mind here. Walmart, which is in, in nearly every community, um, either pays property taxes directly if it owns the, the property that its stores are, are located in, or its landlord pays property taxes. And um, those payments aren't necessarily by Pennsylvania residents, but they're going to get some relief through this measure. Um, when ITEP examined the overall impact of raising the income and the sales tax and expanding the base while reducing what families who are residents of Pennsylvania are paying in property taxes, the net is a positive uh, in the sense that they will pay 334 more dollars in taxes than they are currently paying under property tax elimination. So just to sort of make that as clear as possible, uh, yes, property tax elimination will lower on average your property tax bill, but it will on average raise what you're paying in total for taxes precisely because uh, you will end up paying more in sales and income taxes. And part of the reason that that's happening is because there is a, sh a tax shift embedded in property tax elimination. Um, you are reducing property taxes that are being paid by the shareholders of the Walmart Corporation. And in order to finance that, you're raising taxes on Pennsylvania residents through the sales and the income tax. This is a graphic organized by Income Fifth. So the lowest 20% of Pennsylvania families earn less than $22,000 a year. Um, the top 1% uh, of Pennsylvania families earn $535,000 per year. The figures that are plotted on the graphic are the um, tax change from property tax elimination as a percentage of people's income. So again, we're taking into account that you're paying less property taxes, um, but still the net effect for each group is that everyone's paying um, higher taxes. But the bars in particular notice are much higher for the bottom 60 that would be the, 
bottom 60% of taxpayers. Middle income taxpayers in particular, those earning between 22 and $40,000 a year, they face the biggest increase in their taxes as a percentage of their income. So effectively, property tax elimination by our estimates is increasing the tax burden the most on middle income families. And we'll see some other figures here that'll help sort of um, sort this out. Um, now, given that what we're talking about here is a net tax increase for Pennsylvania families, we thought it would be interesting to examine an alternative proposal that has an advantage over property tax elimination. That, and that advantage is essentially property tax elimination simply replaces locally raised revenue with state revenues. It doesn't increase the amount of revenues that are going to local school districts. And currently there are estimates that um, school districts in order to meet the state's higher standards need between two and $3 billion in, in new state revenues in, in order to meet the state standards and improve um, uh, performance for kids. Uh, but property tax elimination makes no progress towards that goal. Uh, effectively, you're generating large increases in taxes um, uh, that, that generate no new revenue for schools. So we have an alternative proposal um, that would reduce the personal income tax rate on wages and interest from 3.07 to 2.8%, while raising the personal income tax rate on income that is not wages or interest. So basically all other income, this would include, we typically refer to this as income from wealth, so dividends, capital gains, and we do this, and you'll see why we, we think this is a good proposal. Um, this is, again, that same graphic that breaks up the distribution of taxes as a percentage of people's income under property tax elimination and under our alternative proposal of taxing income from wealth. And what you see is that for taxpayers, families earning less than $40,000 a year, they're paying slightly less taxes overall um, under our proposal uh, to cut the essentially the tax rate they're paying on wages and interest um, while increasing the tax rate on dividends and capital gains, et cetera. Most of the burden of our proposal, which again is in, in orange or red, um, falls on the highest income families. Um, and it's, it's a very different distribution than property tax elimination, which puts the biggest burden, at least as a percentage of people's income, uh, on middle income families. So certainly from the perspective of the Keystone Research Center, um, uh, our alternative proposal, we think, has a much better profile and, and does a lot more for middle-income families, both in the sense that they'll, they'll pay either less taxes or, or just a slight increase, and what they'll get out of that exchange is almost $2 billion in, in uh, revenue that can go to fund schools and, and help those schools achieve better performance. This is some more detail because I know taxes as a percentage of your income is a, is a pretty wonky way to think about taxes, um, but it's an important uh, way. Here are the dollar values um, uh, of the two different tax proposals. So property tax elimination on average will raise taxes for the bottom 20% of families, families earning less than $22,000 a year. It'll raise their taxes by $36, a pretty modest amount. Our proposal would cut taxes on that group by a dollar. You move up to middle income families, um, uh, sort of folks earning between $40,000 and $63,000 a year. Under property tax elimination, they're going to pay $326 um, uh, more in, in taxes, even after having their property taxes eliminated. Uh, under our proposal, um, they would pay just $11 on average um, uh, in the next year. So we think obviously this is a good illustration of, of good tax policy in the sense that it asks the most, and, and I'll, we'll, we'll show you the most, it asks the most of, of the highest income families. We can't put uh, the top 1% and, and everyone else on the same graph because the proportions don't quite work out. So I've isolated here families earning more than $104,000. The the, basically, the top 20% of taxpayers in, in Pennsylvania um, earn more than $100,000 a year. And, and you see um, our proposal does ask a lot more of them. Uh, in particular, the top 1% um, would pay a, a pretty steep burden um, from our proposal uh, relative to property tax elimination. And, and we think that's a fair proposal, especially given that, that it's the top 1% that basically have, can, have benefited the most from income growth in the last 36 years in Pennsylvania and in the rest of the country. Now, 
One other, I think, important dimension to talk about um, is uh, that the property tax does have some problems. And in particular, I, I think this is a, a good way to illustrate that, that problem. You're looking here at um, sales and excise and property taxes as a share of family income for Pennsylvania. So this is under current law. So this is, again, doesn't take into account the proposal um, of property tax elimination, although it would not change dramatically. And the first thing you should take away, right, is when you focus on the middle 20% of families, those earning between $38,000 and $60,000 a year, what you notice is that property taxes represent 2.8% on average of their family income. Sales taxes represent 3.9%. And sort of the first takeaway from that is that this is why you impose a much greater burden uh, from property tax elimination on middle income families, because the property tax isn't as burdensome to those families as the sales tax is. And under property tax elimination, you eliminate property taxes in part by um, uh, raising the sales tax and expanding it to cover food and, and other services. And so you're effectively shifting from um, to a more regressive tax, especially for middle income families. Now, in particular, if you keep going to the bottom 20% of families, um, those earning less than $20,000 a year, their property tax burden is higher than every other group. I, I think that's an important thing to recognize. It's 3.8% of their income is paid in property taxes. Um, yet the sales tax is an even more regressive tax for them. Um, and, and we think, you know, this is a good illustration of, you know, if you're really looking to deliver property tax relief in a way that makes sense from a policy perspective, um, is you want to target low income families, in particular with something we call a, a, a property tax circuit breaker. Um, we provide you a link in the paper to a proposal that's that's almost 16 years old, I believe, um, where um, you families, where their property taxes rise above 3.5% of their family income, they don't pay the property tax and, and they get a rebate and we cover um, the school district from the, the lost revenue. We think that's a targeted way um, to make sure that, that low-income families are not burdened um, by the property tax, and we think it's a good idea, and it reflects also our policy with respect to the income tax. Um, we do have income tax forgiveness um, that, that helps low-income families that are impacted by the income tax, and implementing something like a property tax circuit breaker would go a long way towards in, in spreading that very good and sensible policy to, to another tax that does impose a disproportionate burden on low-income families. So, uh, to wrap up um, this very long and difficult discussion, uh, we would argue that the common thread between the two most important issues in the Commonwealth with respect to education, um, the, the inequity um, in school spending across school districts, uh, currently the Commonwealth has a has, a, has been sued uh, by a group of advocates in school districts um, because it has been accused of failing to provide, a, it's following through on its constitutional obligation to provide a thorough and efficient education, um, precisely because you have school districts like Reading um, that do not get as much resources to go to their children as, as in other parts of the state. And, and that is impacting outcomes and performance in those schools and ultimately hurting the performance of the economy at large. Um, and that's an important issue. And we think the inequity and the way in which it's dealt with in other states is through the state contribution to, to local schools, that, that when you have large gaps, that emerge between wealthy and poor communities and school spending, it's the state's duty to step into that gap and equalize it. Um, and we do that through the funding formula, but our argument would be that we need additional state funds to help achieve that goal and close that gap. Um, and, and it is the low state share of spending, which is the driver of that problem. And if we get the state share up, we would eliminate it. The other um, uh, problem that is, related to the low state share of education spending is the agitation that we see that has generated the reason we're having this conversation, the proposals to eliminate property taxes. Um, uh, as we discussed earlier, the increase in revenues um, going to schools 
coming from the state has not kept pace with the revenues that local school districts are raising. Um, the state share is already quite small of, of, of local education spending, and, and it has failed over time to grow. And again, it has failed because um, we have not been able to assemble broad coalitions of lawmakers that would support raising additional revenue. We have put forward here, we think, a very sensible proposal that, that has the advantage of raising $2 billion that would go to schools. Um, it would certainly make an important contribution towards closing the funding gap that exists between individual school districts in the Commonwealth. Um, and we would argue that if the state is able to measurably increase its contribution to local schools, that would reduce the pressure that local school districts and school boards feel to raise property taxes.